Hello everyone and welcome back to the Brick Railway Builders podcast, a podcast all about Lego trains. This is the series where I interview and introduce everybody in the hobby to everyone. Today joining me is Matt of Matt's Brick Railroad Works. Hello Matt, how are you doing? Good Luke, how are you? I am doing wonderful. I've had quite a busy day. I've been making a lot of models recently and I get to record another episode of the podcast. So everything is coming up Millhouse. Hey, I understood that reference. <laughs> so, uh, please formally introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Matt uh, from Matt's Big Railroad Works. I've been in the Lego hobby. I would have said I haven't really had a dark period. I've been pretty much involved since forever since I inherited a lot off my uh, siblings. So, uh, mostly castle and space, most of which we still actually have in some somewhere or other. And then I got interested in doing Lego trains. As a main hobby, I would have said probably around the 2010s, I would have said that's when I started doubling in it because I started buying official Lego sets and modifying them. And then I changed over to doing Lego trains entirely because I used to be, used to have a model railway. Probably around 2014, 15, 16 maybe, I can't exactly remember when. Eventually I've been just been adding to the collection ever since. What can you tell us about your current Lego train collection? It's too big for the space I've got. <laughs> I think that's the same for uh, everyone, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when I originally started doing um, Lego trains, it was effectively modifications on official Lego products. So the first major project, which as anyone who's in the train hobby will do, you start one project and, he, and immediately decide to do other projects. So the first project I ever started and do, um, as a proper project for LEGO trains was building a custom, slightly more realistic version of the Metroliner. So that would have been, so it was going to be effectively you'd have a six car EMU. So similar to how you'd get with the four car set from the official Metroliner starter set and then the club car as well. But with a couple of additions, so there'd be two club cars and there'd also be a extra car, which would be just for luggage and additional seating. Now, obviously, because I've customised it, obviously sleeper trains are very rare, so the sleeping section went entirely. The end units were just for the electrics and maybe some parcels storage or mail storage. And then, you know, it's effectively just a modified version of that and bringing it into a more realistic more flowing sort of sense so you know there isn't suddenly a stop in the middle of the carriage with a wall or something because there's a bed the other side and that sort of thing so so yeah that is above my head on one of the shelves and it's stood sat there for years not doing anything but yeah so then effectively i started off with modifying lego sets um and then i started dabbling in doing custom trains all sorts of freelance stuff but based on what you'd what would be effectively reasonably standard engineering practice and that eventually led to me doing or starting a train called the Brickliner and the Brickliner started off as originally a six wide train pretty much based off what you'd get in a Lego set and by the time I actually gave up on the project it turns into an eight wide two pretty much two scale one to 48 model still freelance but based on what you'd find in an American streamlined passenger train from the 30s. The lo I did have prototype locos which didn't were never completed, but to an extent ran, but never ran a around the official LEGO R40, which is why I kind of gave up on the project, and that's before I discovered wide radius curves. Pretty much the only bit of that left is the tail end of the uh, observation car, so that still exists somewhere. And then pretty much the bulk of my collection actually dates back to the launch of Brick Model Railroader um, and their PS1 uh, 40-foot box car, um, or box van, if you're not an American. And effectively, my collection has just started really from there, expanded with further Brick Model Railroader kits, further Brick Train Depot sort of instruction sets and that sort of thing, and then furrowing into modifications of current other sets or other official instructions, um, sometimes trading certain bits and pieces, or I'll do a bit of de development on a model um, and trade it with somebody for, say, I don't know, a Bricklink Studio file of a boxcar. And it's effectively just been 
adding to that uh, ever since. And although the original's focus on what I wanted to do was going to be, you know, big, you know, heavy express trains of the, you know, 30s, and it'd be all the glamorous sort of art deco sort of thing, because of lack of space, lack of money, um, I've actually been shrinking the scope, as it were, so now it's your sort of, you know, sort of general uh, humdrum uh, connecting line. So basically a freelance freelance version of an interurban um, or a trolley line or street running ra- uh, railroad, uh, which I've called the New York Harbour Railroad. And obviously for that, I'll need a lot of freight cars. So that's primarily what I've been building in the collection. You know, so box cars, reefers, gondolas, flat cars. And then going beyond the sort of basic sort of Lego train collection, it's then also the display. So I've started building the display and sort of standardising on a modified version of uh, the mills instructions you'd find on the old gauge wiki. Take, effectively taking a layer out of those so that the track's actually sitting lower because obviously as a low speed line, it wouldn't be as engineered as you would get from those instructions. And it's just been effectively just adding to that and, making it into a thing where if I have a train of a certain set of cars, I can know that I've got other ones I can then exchange with it, save as a factory, and I drop off a box car full of merchandise, I can then also pick up maybe an empty flat car that's been there, say, yesterday, and it had, I don't know, plywood on it. So effectively, it's going to the point where I'm expanding the collection to a point where I can actually run prototypical operations, and I've, the big sticking point at the moment for that is that I need to get other things sorted, like I don't know, waiting for the FX Brooks P40 turnouts to release, um, and then obviously building the actual display. That is a hell of a lot, and I am so impressed by that all. There's so much detail you went into there. There was a number of things that stood out as well. Going back a moment ago, you said you were interested in the whole Express Art Deco 1930s. That particularly pricks my ears up a bit. <laughs> But yeah, there's definitely so much in there that seems so interesting. So you wanted to do something along the lines of a trolley line, something more along a harbour as well? Yeah, so if you were to go into pretty much any American city, and even, like I said, town, in the 30s, really up until the 50s or 60s, um, and probably even earlier, really, so it's probably starting in like the 1900s, 1910s, all the way through until the 50s or 60s, you would have depending on the size of a city, obviously, and the population, trolley lines, um, or as the Brits and Europeans would call them, trams. And they would be, you're saying a commuter fare, effectively, so instead of buses, you had trolleys. And the reason you had trolleys was because uh, trolleys took up, effectively, a lot less problems than buses were, because buses, obviously, from the time trolleys were invented, didn't have much of a capacity, weren't all that reliable, Um, whereas for trolleys they were fed off electric overhead lines um, as you would find on most trams nowadays they were reasonably speedy obviously because electric it's got uh, electric trains have quite fast acceleration which suits trolleys and trams quite well and it was a way of easily getting people from a to b and the only reason trolleys have really fell out of favor in america and it is something where it's been a bit of a slap on the wrist for America for in terms of transport histories that fuel companies and I think it was Goodyear Tyres, certainly at least one of the tyre companies, if not more than one, uh, colluded and started buying up some of these interurban trolley lines and running them into the ground, uh, not doing the proper maintenance, uh, not doing the repairs, not doing the replacements. Um, and getting to the point where the the trolley company would effectively either not be functional or to the point where it would not make sense to run trolleys because you could replace that with a fleet of buses and the buses would not need the bespoke uh, rail, embedded rail in the surface or the road. They wouldn't need the overhead pantographs. They were a lot more flexible in terms of routing so you wouldn't have to dig up a road to lay new track. Uh, just to run a new service, they could just change on the whim. And there's a mixture, really. It's just uh, for the end of the interurban and trolley, it's, it's a combination of post-World War II cheapness of fuel, so petrol, diesel, 
obviously by this point, the trolley lines have been down in the road for 30, 40, 50 years. The rail needs replacing, and to do that is a very cost-intensive exercise. So obviously, your interurban trolley lines are not going in a point at that in that time period where petrols become affordable. Uh, so you get this point where you know it's the death of the, if you like, the mom and pop railroad as well as the interurban and the trolley because buses and lorries do it so much better. And I say interurban there because there is there is a differentiation. So trolley, so for as I understand it, a trolley line is pretty much just for passenger use, whereas an interurban is something which can run on roads, but it also links towns together. Um, but isn't a fully fledged railroad because it's primarily you know your electric freight motors and trolleys and possibly getting more into the, the sort of more suburban EMU sorts of area. But these are really sort of your independent local lines there to serve the communities and either to, you know, effectively, to use the old adage, bring your people to the factories or to take your goods away. And a lot of these were very small, very local, and effectively a feeder line for bigger railroads, um, maybe the next town over. So you've definitely done a lot of research for the kind of railway that you want to build then. Yes, so in terms of research, um, obviously there's a lot of what I would call promotional material. So obviously you take that with a pinch of salt and maybe a bit of trepidation, but certainly a lot of railroads and that sort of stuff in America was quite, I would say, reasonably well documented either in terms of promotional material from the uh, railroad companies themselves, from news press articles, um, clippings, newsreel footage as well. Because, of course, bear in mind, and you're talking about the, if you like, the 30s, 40s, a lot of, you wouldn't have, you didn't have television in those days, um, so you'd have newsreels. So your newsreel would get sent to the local cinema and before a film they'd maybe play the newsreel so you maybe you'd have the presidential speech so they'd show clips of that or maybe there's you know the launch of a new aircraft or this that and the other and that to get played by the newsreels um so you've got those to refer back to as well sometimes and then as well you had especially during world war ii uh, one of the u.s departments actually went out and photographed pretty much coast to coast american life in you know 1941 to 1945 give or take you so obviously that's slightly beyond uh, what i'd like to model but certainly if you look at buildings um, and some of the infrastructure even going back to that time that might plus or minus 10 years largely didn't change uh, or reasonably didn't change so you can always use that as inspiration or that sort of thing um, but primarily, a lot of the stuff I've sort of got through in terms of research, outside of the old photographs and stuff you can find on the internet, is actually just books. So although I have cleaned out a lot of the British railway books I did have, which were normally a bit more generic and sort of, you know, here's a compendium of photos from this person or whatever, um, it's been replaced with a lot of, say, schematic diagrams. Uh, this is a book on this railroad. This is a, you know, a, you know what have you, a set of schematics on freight cars this is a you know a portfolio of stuff on this railroad you know this is a compendium of locomotive uh, schematics all scaled correctly and you know and that sort of stuff and then you've got in terms of research well you've got dvds so you've got um, people out with their eight millimeter uh, cine cameras um, doing footage from from i would have said really sort of like the mid 30s onwards uh, obviously, going to that point, you get it's grainy from that perspective, but it's it's usable, and obviously as well, you, you know, you're talking about in terms of history, films. You know, you, you look at you know your sort of Hollywood era, that sort of era. Um, it's all got it's you know a lot of the scene. It's you know it's all sort of humdrum stuff. It, it's to do with say commuting or that sort of stuff, and you'd have trains and that. And there's footage, uh, certainly um, you'd have certain people who would film, like, you know, they'd go out and stick a camera on a train, point it out to the one side and record an entire trip of the train because then they'd go to the studio and actually project that onto a, uh, you know, like a canvas or something. And then they'd have a set in the studio to replicate the train and the camera footage merged with the set in the studio would actually recreate, recreate a train um, and then do things like that. And sometimes that footage can come in real useful 
if you want to do say a cityscape or something you know and there's it's one of the things in terms of research is that you start going down rabbit holes um so i don't want to go too far but i will say that realistically there's a lot of sources you can get um some of them uh, like me for american so for example the uh, library of congress um, has a lot of old school photographs Certain historical societies have a lot of photographs as well and records and, you know, employee reports and that sort of stuff. And you'd have things like old, you know, for Britain, for example, you'd have ordnance survey maps. A lot of those from, you know, sort of an older period are that detailed enough. They'll list all the track diagram. And obviously you've got all this sort of stuff where you've got, you know, this sort of thing about research is it's a, you can go as deep and as detailed as you want, but... You know, it depends on how much detail you want to go. If you just want a, if you like a broad strokes display or something, you may not want to get it out down to like the neck, the closest stud or half stud. So yeah, that's definitely a lot of good material that you can find when it comes to researching. I know that there's a lot of old posters and newsreels, like you said a moment ago, where you can definitely find so much to get something exactly right. And I think you used the right frame a moment ago as well. Uh, going down rabbit holes we've been about a quarter of an hour into the podcast already and we're still going through what your current lego train collection is about there's nothing like detail absolutely so speaking of detail i know that you have built some amazing models and i remember the last thing i saw you build was a uh, switcher diesel i think so what would you say is your favorite model that you have built so far probably have to um, that's a difficult one. I'd probably have to say it's going to be that switch diesel. Now, admittedly, it's not a model I've built from scratch. Um, I will happily hold my hand up there. Um, the switch model you refer to is a New Haven Alco uh, HH600. So getting away from the anagrams and the short form, um, it it's actually a, a full form of it, if you like, is the American locomotive company High Hood 600. Um, and that is a designation given by enthusiasts or rail fans, which means it's an American locomotive company product, Alco being one of the major American manufacturing companies uh, for railroad locomotives and equipment, um, primarily locomotives. And HH or high hood actually refers to the style of body, um, which is a high hood rather than a low hood, for obvious reasons. And then the number is actually just the horsepower of the engine inside. So the model it's based off is actually on a Union Pacific high hood 1000 model. And what I've done was I've used photographs of the real thing, and some of that from books, some of that's from the internet and backdate the model from the 1000 horsepower version down to the 600 horsepower version um, and re-colour it for New Haven pumpkin scheme, if you like, uh, which is the dark green for the sills and the cab and the bonnet roof and orange for the main body. It's obviously not complete. There's decals missing, um, particular uh, for that model of Loco in the New Haven livery. It's missing the distinctive sweep of the dark green uh, which should be near the cab now obviously there's a bit of a problem with that is that next to the cab on what is the driver's side for, for american models um, is a set of ladders so i might have to be a bit of artist's interpretation when it comes to that side but certainly it, it looks the part you can tell it's a new haven um it's the the new haven livery is very distinctive in that sort of regard and I actually had a bit of problem with building it in, in the New Haven livery because the New Haven livery is obviously dark, it has dark green. And dark green is, isn't, although it is a, is a reasonably plentiful colour, uh, depending on the parts you're after, it, it's still a bit limited. And one of the big things on the model that is a bit restrictive is the, I'm not sure quite what they are, but the, to, to use the more literal term, there's some bumps on top of the uh, bonnet roof, which in scale form are represented by two by four tiles. So in terms of doing research, you all yeah, well, it's a two by four tile, surely Lego has done two by four tiles in dark green. And you'd be right, they have, um, but they only actually appeared uh, to my knowledge in one set, which is the Brickhead's Jurassic 
world set uh, featuring Blue and Chris Pratt's character. Um, so I had to buy copies of that set just to get the tiles. And it's quite funny, I can't remember who I was talking to, whether it was on uh, one of the Discords I'm on or in person. But to get the tiles for that model, it was cheaper to buy the full brickhead set second hand and just take the tiles out um, to do the model. So that was a bit of an interesting debate, sort of getting all the uh, parts together. And then to give it a bit more of a fancy nature, um, it's actually got a control system from model uh, railroads in America called LocoFi, which actually is locomotive control over Wi-Fi. So you effectively connect to the uh, onboard circuit using Wi-Fi, so it generates its own Wi-Fi network, um, you then hot, uh, connect onto that using your phone, uh, and then you control it over Wi-Fi. So you can, you know, ring the bell, toggle the headlights on or off, and obviously you've got directional and speed control. And it will be getting changed at some point. I will uh, be changing over to um, Soundtrax's Blue Army in there. That will be getting a bit of a refurb at some point. It's already had a mini refurb being changed from the original Lego Power Functions M motors to Cader's micro motors. And the reason I say one motor to two motors is the design calls for a Power Functions medium motor, or the original design calls for a Power Functions medium motor per bogey. And because the electronics I've put in are a lot bigger, um, or certainly take up a lot more room, I've had to strip out, well, I had to strip out the rear motor because the rear motor was simply too tall and I couldn't fit anything with it, but now that I've moved to these Kader Micro Motors, I've been able to fit a second one in um, with some adjustment to the structure, so that the it, the motor's actually anchored um, properly. And then I've also been able to, you know, fit, you know, it comes with the speaker and everything, so not only does it light up and move, it also makes sounds as well, which is a rather neat thing when you have it on the display. You, you know, it's it's silent pretty much silent um, when the battery's on but it's not doing anything and you just do the engine fire up sequence and you hear the spluttering and it kicks into life and then you you know switch the headlights on switch the bell on and away you go and it's it's something quite magical when you know you don't expect it to have that sort of feature absolutely there's a couple of things i wanted to kind of touch up on there i took a couple of notes so first of all with what you just said with speakers and all the details i think I've seen, I don't know if this is something where, you know, you say something and magically through the force you just see a couple of models online where they're experimenting with something like a speaker to add more sounds. I know that Levi from LUKR is looking into, or I think he actually has a BR Class 10 with a speaker. I think he's still working on getting the sounds finalised. And there might be another club mate that's working on that, but I can't remember. And there was another person I saw a while, I think it was just one of those flashes when i came back to twitter for a bit but i do remember seeing someone else just experimenting with a speaker so i think this is something that people will well i suppose more hardcore people especially when they configure all the electronics will slowly but surely work a speaker into their models which i think would be really cool i know that's um i just remember as well that's glenn holland i remember watching one of his old videos it's either on his channel or on the brick model railroader channel um, he's got his Crusader, I believe it's called. Like it's mostly like grey with some blue details, and he has a speaker at least in that model. And that was a really fun thing to see in here. Right. So uh, to clarify a few things, there, Levi's model. Um, I'm not. I can't confirm the class. I know it's an old uh, Southern Railway based diesel. Um, actually has um, an official. I would, I would call it official, um, a Lego aftermarket product called PFX Bricks, which is made by FX Brick. Uh, now, obviously. That is a, I'd, I'd, I'd call it a functional sound system. I wouldn't say it's the best system out there. Um, I'd say it's quite easily eclipsed by Blue and Army, for, in terms of bespoke train control at least. But it is a Lego uh, system, well, well, Lego compatible system, where you can control it by Bluetooth or infrared. And it's, it's an okay system, you know, in terms of the, for the, Lego train hobbyist, I think. It's only been eclipsed by Blue and Army, which is a lot more, obviously, for because it's effectively DCC of the Bluetooth, and the Blue and Army is a lot more appropriate uh, for train models. Um, it's got a lot more functionality and 
design features, if you like, catered for being a train model. That's not to say that the PFX brick is necessarily bad. It does have, you know, um, output synchronized sound, so it will chuff according to how many revolutions you code it to. So obviously it, it picks up how many pulses the motor's sending and that sort of stuff, and it feeds back off that and then decides how many chuffs it's doing. But FX Bricks were did have a blog post at some point saying they were going to improve some of the functionality on it, improve give some more sound sets and that sort of stuff. And don't get me wrong, it is a functional product, but it is a bit more restrictive in what you can do. Um, it's not an easy product to use, I would argue. Um, it's, there's a lot of it's, there's a bit of a learning curve with it compared to other products um, you can get. And Glenn's. Um, Glenn's um, Reading Crusader is a very nice model. Um, I've never actually seen it in the flesh. Um, I've never actually seen uh, Glenn um, in in person as well, which is something I is something we need to fix because uh, I think uh, me and Glenn will probably have quite a lot to talk about of, of some description. Uh, yeah, so Glenn's Crusader model um, actually has something called Dali Electronics. Can't remember the precise name of it, um, but it's made by Dali Electronics. And he's actually done a custom link with power functions infrared. Um, so basically the way it works is that infrared controls the motor. Um, one of the channels controls the motor and the other channel controls the bell and the whistle. So basically there's a thing where you turn. The way it's coded is that you turn the bell on or off via one spin, via spinning the dial in one way. And then you turn, the, you toggle the whistle by turning it the other way. So you, to, you sort of effectively rotate it towards one way. And once it picks up, it starts playing the horn, the whistle or the horn, uh, depending on which uh, board you went for. And then you turn it again to turn the horn, uh, the horn or the whistle off. That is a system I'd like to get my hands on because I'd love to have a copy for my Pennsylvania Railroad T1. Unfortunately, at the moment, as as per quite a lot of uh, hobbyist electronics or consumer electronics um, there's a chip shortage going about which has caused a lot of problems with actually getting that sort of st- st- style of product so they're currently out of stock for the moment um, but I'd be looking to certainly get one um, because that with that system it's although it is not a control system for the motors and that sort of stuff um, it's quite easily integrated and gives you either motor synchronized uh, chuff or sensor synchronized chuff and you've also got your you know your bells and whistles related to that as well so you can actually give quite a good effect and that system is actually well when it when it is available it's actually available in steam diesel and electric varieties so there is there's certainly products out there um, in the market to add extra if you like sounds and lights and stuff now, now and i would and I would clarify the sound thing with a, you know, a couple of stars and, you know, pointers. Sounds is very subjective. And I would say that depending on the model you get, you're not going to get a completely accurate sound, especially if you're doing an exhibition. Uh, depending on the location you do the exhibition as well, the sound is often drowned out by either the crowds near the display uh, from talking or just from the fact that it's just a large space and the the system isn't loud enough to cope with the large space. So it might be at uh, when you're at home or in a workshop or on a home display, it's perfectly fine. But when you get to a, an exhibition venue, it's not loud enough. So you might be able to hear it if you, you've pretty much got your ear pressed against the model, but maybe not if you're a couple of feet away. So for those adding sound, that's probably a bit more of a cautious note to be aware of that, you know, sound and lights are great but obviously everything in moderation Uh, sounds and lights especially control systems for the sound can add quite a lot of cost to a model when it's not necessarily something that adds a great deal of added appeal to it i would say yeah that's a very good point as well there's been times not necessarily just with lego dress but there's so many examples where you can look at people who have poured so much money and resources into getting all of these little bits to combine them all together to try and make something that they think will be amazing, only for some pieces of that project, or even maybe all of them at some point, you know, it might just not all fall together as well as they think. And I think with something like that, if you really want to make sure it's 
um, that it's working as well as you think it will. You could just follow the train around the layouts with a little microphone and a speaker somewhere. Improving sound is not it's not too bad a thing. You can just literally just put an amplifier circuit into the sound output and uh, plug a bigger speaker in, and you can get bigger sounds. And certainly, if you're going down a more official Lego route, I I hasten to be one of those people to say that Lego did do it do it as well. Um, if you use powered up, and you have a powered up train, um, whether it's steam diesel or electric. Lego do actually do a sound system via the Power Functions app. Um, so you can actually link in, and whether it's the Disney train sound scheme or just one of the standard diesel electrics, um, they also give sound. Admittedly, it's via your phone, but something that I did learn via the standard, you know, sort of like the uh, model train community, is you can get what, what are called uh, Bluetooth sugar cube speakers. Yes, the sugar uh, cubes. No, I've heard of them, yeah. Yeah, so they're not particularly big. They probably measure maybe a couple of centimeters to an inch in in diam in you know all dimensions because as as per the description, they're supposed to be sugar cube size, so they're cubes. And what you can do is they're Bluetooth linked, so you can actually what you can do is Bluetooth from your phone to the the powered up hub, and also to the speaker because the speaker and the power functions hub are different devices. So you're allowed to do that. And then what you can do is you can control the train via the Power Functions app and it will control the train. But then the sound is redirected to the speaker and you can actually fit the speaker into, say, the Loco or maybe the Tender if it's a Steam Loco or maybe a following carriage um, or freight car. Um, and you can actually get sounds that way. So you're using an official Lego system, admittedly with a Bluetooth aftermarket Bluetooth speaker, but that nevertheless gives you sound via Bluetooth. And obviously the thing with that is that you can then change, if the Bluetooth speaker's still got enough charge after you've used it, if the power, or if you want to change trains, you can always take the Bluetooth speaker out of that train, put it in another one, and connect it to another train, and then just change the sound scheme you're using, and then you're still getting the same effect of you've got train-based sound, but it's not produced by the train in and of itself, it's actually produced via the app and just shared uh, via the Bluetooth speaker. Yeah, that was actually really good when you mentioned the powered up system because it is actually really clever. And the first thing I think of is how many people have used the color sensors to get a couple of automated um, railway projects going, which I think is really cool. And yeah, the idea of being able to link more things to the powered up system to have basically what you just described is definitely an easier sort of opportunity to pull off something like sound for example but i was also going to say i wonder if one day lego would potentially make a powered up compatible or like an official one. i don't know if official but um i wonder if lego would make something compatible with powered up where it's their own little speaker because people can can code their own things into it because you know obviously it'll be something small enough to fit inside a model somehow it'll probably cost a hundred pounds because it's lego you know of course it will but I think something a bit more official in terms of just a speaker, just to save hassle for a lot of people that want to experiment with this, I think would be a really cool thing to see in the future. The only problem is, is and I hate, I hate to be the person who points out, but Lego hasn't exactly had a good track record with trying to go for fancy electronics. That's not to say they can't do it. Obviously, we've had, you know, the all the fancy stuff in terms of like the um, Lego for education. Um, so you've all got all, all the educational robots. You've got, you know, lot the old 9 volt system. You had sirens, you had lights and all that yeah, sort of stuff. Yeah, the sirens um, and the lights. I remember them. I remember having one years ago, like figuring out what it was, pressing down the button and it made the siren noise and I'm trying to press the button again to make it stop. And that was, that was probably enough for me. It got to be said. But then there's always the other thing, you know, and, and, you know, this is also sort of one of the things where, in some respects, I am slightly defending Lego here. If they make a product, it's for Lego, from Lego's perspective, it's got to be suitable across multiple product lines. Yeah, uh, I'd probably absolutely. say it's probably the best terminology. And obviously, if you're making something very p specific, especially if you're talking about trains, um, something train specific probably wouldn't sell well uh, on the basis that 
you know, this is the whole this is the whole thing when you get to talking about Lego trains and why don't Lego make more. <laughs> Retailers probably wouldn't stock it, so it'd have to probably be a Lego official exclusive. So unless you're going to order it from Lego or go to a Lego shop and buy it in person, you know, the market reach is severely diminished. And if you make it generic enough so it works across multiple things like Technic or that sort of stuff, you're probably going along the sort of more... I would sort of say power functions lines of you're probably better off just having something where the speaker hooks into the hub and you just sell the speaker as an optional extra but then the problem with that is that you because lego marketed it as a toy you've got to have all the toy safety standards so it's got to you know you can't swallow it if it's less than a three if a, if a kid's less than three the connection's got to be suitable enough so it won't give them a shock and it's one of them things where the probably the development cost probably outweighs any perceived benefits and i'd probably say as well for a lot of people the fact that they can motorize a model and control it with their phone or with a remote is probably well it probably said 80 percent of what most people want yeah that's um, all it needs to be you know and while sound systems and lights i mean you can get power powered up lights obviously um, and while that sort of thing is probably very good it's probably also the thing where Maybe you know you'd, you'd probably argue that maybe they're pushing the pushing slightly too far into trying to get too much electronics into Lego, when maybe aftermarket products or maybe ones from other hobbies probably do the job, not only better, uh, but probably for a more appropriate price point. So this is my favourite part of the podcast. This is my favourite question to ask people: What is your ideal Lego train set? I'd probably have to say, if I was going to go for an ideal Lego train set, now, now I'd like to query this as a question, is, co is cost no object? This is just in your mind, if you went into a toy shop or the Lego shop, you just saw your perfect Lego train set just there on the shelf, it was exactly what you wanted, what in your mind would that be? I'd probably have to say... I'd probably say something like a small tank engine, sort of like a small steam engine, a small steam tank engine, or maybe a, um, a small diesel, and probably, probably two or three um, freight wagons or freight cars. And I think, and depending on what control system was used, if any, uh, probably a remote as well, because that probably satisfies um, a lot of what I'd probably want. Two or three. Uh, freight cars or wagons is, is enough to have a bit of variety maybe if you feel that you know if you're going for certainly British and European stuff um, the because they're obviously a lot smaller than the American size you can probably fit, squeeze in probably another one or two so you can probably fit a brake van or brake car in there as well and you can you know have a lot of and this is the thing as well when it comes to tr uh, train sets as well is that you know it's supposed to be fun to a degree so obviously if you get if you're talking about that sort of level you've got enough variety in the wagons at all that you've got a bit of variety in those uh, and then obviously then if you've got say an open wagon you can then change out loads so you know maybe you can fit a tractor to it for one day maybe take that off and maybe put some you know maybe some wooden planks or something another you know and having some like that means you can cycle around what what it's carrying and then also add to the fun so that's a really good answer. I like that when you started saying that, just a small tank engine or a small diesel on its own, immediately my mind went to the crocodile locomotive we got in 2020. And it was definitely a product that came out of nowhere and got a lot of attention. So there's always the possibility that LEGO could try something like that again. Like you mentioned with a small tank engine or a diesel. I think the legendary or infamous, depending on you know how many times you see this engine, the British Railways Class 08 Shunter Diesel would be one that a lot of people might be interested in seeing, just because, at least with some circles, it's quite a recognisable locomotive. But the inclusion of a couple of wagons as well is a nice bundle. It's basically, just what you're saying, and there's that kind of... Again, the word bundle came to mind, because there was also some similarities that my mind made in terms of your description and the My Own Train set, which, again, in some circles, it seems like that is slowly creeping up as something that people would want to see again yeah and i mean this is the 
but this is the whole thing I've said and I and I was even made a I would say a medium length forum post on it a while ago um, I think the big issue with Lego trains uh, and it's and it's a uh, eventually you'd have to turn the entire train line on its head um, but I think the big problem with Lego trains is that Lego wants to sell the consumer a complete out-of-the-box product which basically means that if you buy a Lego train set, you not only get the train, you also get the controller and the track to run it on. What I would argue is that you're probably better off, from a consumer price point, removing the track out of, the, of Lego train sets, having them on more of a... I can't remember which brand it is, I think it's Tomy. Uh, oh, the right, Tomy Play Rail, where they yes. just had the no, track no, strips no, see, individually. Yeah, as I say, I'm going back to the days when Toys R Us was a, still a physical brick and mortar store. Yes, I know exactly um, what you're going to say, and I love it. And that is <laughs> splitting track out of train sets, so that you, your train set effectively is literally just the loco and the wagons it's supposed to be pulling. And the reason I say that is that obviously you can go a bit at, beyond and maybe have like if you know you say you're doing a freight car for for you know 2024 or whatever you'd have your train and maybe if you'd got a flat car with a timber load and you'd want to include a forklift you could include a forklift but because you separate the track away from the train anyone who's buying that as a train set doesn't have to bend it isn't left with a bundle of track so you can still keep you know, a standard, I don't know, a circle of track as a starter pack. You can maybe have a pack of turnouts as an additional pack and maybe have another straight and curve pack. And then you just, then in addition to those, you then just have your passenger train and your freight train. And you can then just cycle around those two train sets every four years. Maybe update your packaging to coincide with that change of product. But then you're not actually changing your product, you're just literally changing around the trains. It does a couple of things, is that that then frees up shelf space because the train sets themselves aren't as big. It means, means the train sets are more uh, appropriate because then if you want the track to go with your train set, oh, here's a circle of track you can get, here's a track pack. And, it, it, and this is the thing with LEGO, is that it, it breeds, all right, I hate to use the word, but it breeds expandability. If you want more track, you've got a circle of track and you bought the freight set, it goes around in the circle, yeah, very nice. But maybe you want a siding or a spur to put some freight cars on, or maybe you want a dead-end terminus for your passenger train. You can do that because then you can just buy the additional pack, track pack you want. You know, we're starting to go a bit into sort of like the Hornby um, and maybe sort of like the Backman Thomas sort of range where it's, you know, a track mat and preset track plan, but... From my perspective, if you change it so that the, just the trains themselves cycle around and they don't actually come with track, the boxes are smaller, the prices are better, um, and if you've already got a train collection, you're not repeat buying track you don't need. And that's the big bugbear. If you buy, I don't know, the passenger train and the freight train, you get a lot of curved track. And then if you go four years down the line when LEGO do release their next wave of trains, you're then just buying more curved track and you're not actually getting enough straight track to counteract the curved track to make it worthwhile. So then what happens is that Lego just flood the market with curved track and then you end up with people going, I've got these, you know, thousand curve pieces I don't need and I've got no use for them. And which is why when you look at aftermarkets, especially the curved track is so cheap, is because it's, you know, if you buy a train set and you want the train but not the track, you just sell the track and normally the track especially with passenger train sets, is always curved. So it wastes, you know, this is all the whole thing, you know, time back into the start, if you split the, tra the track away from the trains and sell the track separately, you're not having to pay extra for the track, you can buy the track you want separately or as you want to expand it, and then if, when you buy trains, you're not actually paying extra just for track you're not using. That is a very spot on thing there, yeah. When you said about all the excess curves, I immediately turned around and looked at a box I've got with all my sort of excess track and a couple of track pieces that I don't really use that often. And I've got about 13 circles worth of the normal R40 curves. 
And it's like, yeah, again, when you just buy all those sets, all that track accumulates and it's just something that never gets used. But I also love how you describe the ability to potentially sell used track pieces as its own thing, like a pack of straights, a pack of curves, and the logo on the wagons, like you mentioned, sold separately. So the way that I'm picturing it is in those tall, thin boxes. Again, when you said about the Tomy sort of style toy packaging, it was really good. And the way that you said, the way that you lent that into how it kind of fits on the shelf and the packaging is something more consumer friendly, I thought that could genuinely really, really work. I can imagine as well, this sort of, well, not so much a shelf, you know, where it's all hooked on this rack thing, whatever you would call that, but it's all hooked up onto the shelf and it's all these long, tall boxes, you know, straight track, straight track, curve track, curve track, something a similar size box, but it's just, here's enough for a small locomotive and two wagons. And that's just there. It's, uh, in my mind, it looks incredible and I wish it would come to existence. There was another thing as well that I wanted to ask a moment ago when it came to describing that kind of set. So a locomotive and a few wagons is definitely a very good idea for a set on the consumer side of things. Because again, get rid of the track, basically going through what you said earlier. That's kind of close to what Mold King have done, I think. I don't remember if Mold King sets come with track, but um, have you seen any of those Mold King sets? I have seen it, uh, some. I think it was Mold King who did the China Airways QJ locomotive and the coal pop, uh, popper. Yes, or it the was. Or coal gondola. And those look, and, and this is this is the thing as well, and this is partially the reason why I think Lego really need to have a bit of review of their train line. Aftermarket products, or certainly companies doing aftermarket like all their own trains, I should say at this point, are starting to get to the point where they're you know admittedly they're aiming more towards the teenager slash adult market but they're more detailed they're not particular although they are pricey that they're, they're not what i would say extortionate or oh too expensive and the thing is as well i'd say for certainly like the qj and you know that sort of side in terms of actual product if you look at lego trains as a product or trains in general, which are made of interlocking bricks. Um, outside of LEGO, you're starting to get people like Mold King uh, and that sort of stuff making their own. But in terms of like, the pure LEGO hobby, outside of some sets made by Brick Mania um, and some kits offered by a couple of other, you know, sort of determined, uh, certainly in the UK's cottage industry. Um, outside of a few of those, there isn't actually a lot of brick-built trains available as complete kits. So people at Mold King, who I know when I w went past the um, Tech Brick uh, stand at one of their shows, they've actually got Mallard, as I said. And, you know, if you look at that, you sort of go, well, Mold King can do it, why can't Lego? I think in that case, it's more so having to spend the time to do the research into the market seeing how many people would actually go for it. And yeah, I, there is a lot of things to take into account when it comes to the business side of things, but there is no reason why they can't at least try it. And something I have said, and I know you've read, um, I know that you've seen me make this comment in a couple of places, and I have said yeah. this in a number of spaces. Uh, do you know what I'm going to say? I have is suspicions. It... Yeah. <laughs> But I think I've definitely probably said this in at least one previous episode where, you know, there's again, Lego could absolutely take the time to go into this and probably even if it's just an experiment, if it doesn't go well, then that's completely OK, because at least they tried. But with how they've handled things, to me, I am kind of convinced that let's all say it together now. Lego hate trains. Yes. <laughs> But yeah, it's, again, there's so much to take in for what can be done. And it is actually quite surprisingly accurate with what you said just now as well. Lego, Mold King, and what Brick Mania have done. I cannot think of any other brick toy company that have made their own sets. I know that Blue Bricks do them, but that's just because that came to mind a moment ago when we were talking about this. But it's really surprising. Well, I don't know how many brick toy companies are out there to begin with, but the fact that there aren't that many railway themed sets to begin with, again, just a full on kits. 
I know railways is a very specific thing anyways, and we would love to see more of them, but we don't want to have it in a way where railway themes become more dominant compared to city stuff, spaceship stuff, castle stuff, you know, other things that other people will enjoy. But just having more options would be so beneficial. Yeah, and I think this feeds into the Lego's Catch-22 with trains, is that there's not... There's not enough of the perceived market for them to do a lot of products and for them to invest the resources. But at the same time, if they don't do enough, it kind of makes their mould costs and everything else not worthwhile. And if you look at the city range, if you don't do trains, that's very noticeable. Yes, it uh, is. From the fact that trains do not exist. I mean, it is a bit noticeable that trains don't really exist currently. But at least you're still getting a couple of set cycle, uh, new sets every couple, of, uh, well, every four years, in terms of the normal cycle. And I think in terms of trains, we, um, obviously we we ought to point out at this point uh, we did have the uh, crocodile back in 2020. And while Lego are a private company and don't release their market information, you know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, it does seem that if you look at anecdotal evidence, the crocodile, whether it's a lack of production numbers or a oh it's a lack of production numbers or just the fact that it's been available its availability was very much when you went to buy it it was either out of stock or you know stock arriving soon and when it did arrive in stock it was often sold out within a week so it could just be of course that you know it's a pandemic you know people were at home you know it did sell reasonably well it's not you know it's not. It wasn't. It's not going to be the best version of the crocodile. You know, I think anyone would admit that. Um, but certainly, from a company perspective, for a company that is very goes, you know, uses a very tight radius um, as their standard curve, the crocodile, from their perspective, wasn't. If if it has sold well, is a roaring success. And this is the thing with the interval tra- trains and their you know market share, model trains. For as some people will call it, or a bit of a niche niche hobby or a niche hobby. Now that's not to say that the market share of model trains isn't poor. There was something saying that the train market, the model train sort of market in America, is somewhere between seven to ten billion dollars a year. And obviously you extrapolate around around the world, and it's a fair number. But then when you look at Lego trains, you're talking a niche of a niche because it's you have to be in Lego to build Lego trains. And then Lego trains are a subset of Lego itself. So it's you're getting, you know, your pool if effectively is getting smaller and smaller as you go down the line. The argument always is with Lego, well, if you don't make the investment, you're never going to get the return to make further investment or further product. But I think really we this is the sort of thing with Lego, is that if you go into and I'm gonna say it any generic toy store whether it's uh, the entertainer whether it was toys r us whether it was anything out any pretty much any decently sized toy store you've got wooden trains you've got the plastic sort of like tomy uh, sort of trains there is a gap there after i would say sort of like your baby slash toddler slash young child sort of range for a train based thing but the problem with lego trains is that you've got to get the retailers on board in saying that this is a product that will sell well but then the problem is you've got to convince retailers that you're actually keen on getting the products out there and if you're only doing a set every four years then you know is there much impetus to actually carry them so moving on to our next question, do you have a favourite or standout Lego train builder that you are following online? I would have to say that there are many, <laughs> I wish I don't wish to incriminate myself on this question, um, I would say there are many people out there who build fantastic models and there's many who do, you know, you, you, don't, you don't expect something and then all of a sudden they're coming out with something just like, I never even knew you'd built that. You know, and case in point, Glen Holland, the tail end of last year, came out with not one but two fantastic steam locomotive models. But for me, if I'm going to go out for a standout train builder, especially for 
British stuff because I build American, you know, well, I can recognise a good American model, but every so often you want that little bit of a taste of home. And he's not British, but I have to say British bricks can knock British models out of the park. You know, I've not watched, well, I've not really looked at anything recently that he's done, but I know that you look at um, those footage of his uh, LNER stuff running at one of the show, shows in Australia, and you just look at it and you just think, my word, he's not even... You know, he must have so little resources to go off, but the models are absolutely fantastic. I just knew that you were going to say, I think British Bricks has been mentioned every episode so far. Now, when you gave that first hint, he's, you know, he builds British, I was like, oh, go on, just say what I think you're going to say. And then you did, I was like, ah, oh. it's like a mini celebration of sorts. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, well, this is the thing, if you look at sort of like your, um, you're sort of like, if almost if you like, home market share after, you know there's the american builders and then really it's almost like after the british builders it's almost it's almost like after the american builders it's the british builders or people who build british trains that come second um and then you've got so like the europeans and the australians after that because the australians and i don't know how but the australian market australians have an absolutely huge portion of people who build trains out there in australia that are based on australian models and he's just like well, it's, it's certainly perceived that way. It's like they've, they've got enough to fill a hole with them. It's like, well, you know, it's like you look at the British stuff, and it's just like, well, he's got a little bit, he's got it. It's like immense. You know, I, I, I hate to point out British bricks, but there, was, there is always the, what I, what I what to call always the bridesmaid, but possibly not quite always the bride, and that's uh, Trace Pierce, who, who his Lego persona is Pierce Bricks, and his 14xx that he's showed pictures of when he first showed pictures of that off it was just like it, it, i can see where you're going with it but it's not out and out the best 14xx i've seen he's not there yet so yeah trace recently uploaded a couple of pictures to the lego rail facebook group uh he showed off his latest incarnation of that tank engine to have an eight stud wide running board and looking at previous versions of that model, again, this is his favourite locomotive, so he's always tweaking it with a couple of extra pieces, but he finally dipped his toes into building models with an 8-wide base. And I think this is now the point where he's reaching his true potential. That's a proper, proper good-looking model that he's made now. Yeah, uh, you know, it's you, you looked at the first iteration of it, and it's like, it's, 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 it's there, but, you know, you can tell what it is, but it's not quite what you'd, what you'd call a... You know, a good, it's a good model, but it's not quite what I'd call the best model. You know, I've seen people attempt, and then he comes up with this one, you know, within the past couple of weeks, and he's just like, this is above and beyond what you'd done before, and it's certainly looking fantastic. The only thing is now, he needs to start building stuff that matches that one. Yeah, it's definitely a case of try to build a new model from scratch to match that detail. Instead of looking at your past models and going, hmm, because the temptation of upgrading your previous models could potentially be disastrous. I keep looking back at a couple of models I still have. That's our, I can very clearly tell that these models are a few years old and I would love to be able to buy new wheels, get some more parts, get another roll of trim line tape, etc. And just basically overhaul it to be into the same build quality that I do today. But at the same time, I feel like I don't really want to because, again, having to spend and invest all that money and resources into making those models work. Yeah, and the other... I mean, this is the other problem as well. You get to a point, especially in terms of trying to refurbish and upgrade older models, you know, you may have gone off some de uh, details or instructions or some dimensions which are not 100 percent accurate so there may be, so you might have to rescale the model and you think well i'm built you know i built this for example in seven wide and i want to upgrade it to eight i'll just add a bit here add a bit there and it'll do the problem with that is that you're then stretching a seven wide model into an eight wide model when in some respects you're probably just better off starting from scratch and building a model better than what you've done before because you know it, it, lego especially releases dozens of new parts a year um, some of which are very useful to us as train builders some of which not so much you know i don't i haven't i've yet to see someone using the new disney princess skirt piece in the train model 
lo and behold, there'll probably be one by the time this pod, this uh, podcast goes out. But uh, you know, one of them things where Lego will produce a lot of molds which are, and a lot of parts which, you know, even two, three, four years ago, you wouldn't have expected them to make in, you know, a lot your lifetime. And all of a sudden, they're just going, you know, oh yeah, here's a three by three, one brick high rounded dome. It's like. You know, that's perfect for doing, you know, an end of a streamlined train or maybe a top end of a articulated lorry trail. And it's like, you know, where was this, you know, all these years ago? I could have, you know, used it back then. Yeah, definitely. I think I mentioned this in a previous episode when it came to um, talking about a model where it was going from one size and dimension up to the eight wide size and dimension where you are basically just stretching and awkwardly remoulding a model that already is built. It was my British Railways 9F, and it was brought one stud wider. The tender looked really good, but the boiler, I felt like it was kind of still fine as is, but the boiler itself, I didn't rebuild to accommodate this new wider running board, and it looked really out of place, and eventually it ultimately got scrapped. But that was more because it was a model I didn't really want anymore. But yeah, it was definitely a case of you are much better off going near from the beginning again than trying to you know, pinch pieces and squeeze it and try to make it look like something you think is better uh, just because you were able to do it with one or two other models in the past. So my final question for you is what projects do you have in the works and what do you hope to build in the future? Oh... Where do we start on the to-do list that's longer than my arm? Um, so at the moment, I'd probably say in some relative closeness to the workbench, there's the Pennsylvania Railroad uh, T1 4444 duplex. Now, that has been a model that I did say in a video last year I wanted to have a working chassis for. Um, and while the chassis is there um, and... You know, the wheels turn, and um, there's connecting rods on it. The motors aren't connected to the drive wheels yet. The motors also need some support because at the moment they're just flopping about, you know, doing whatever they like to do. There's no leading or training bogies. The tender is mostly there, but it needs some work. You know, there's a lot of bits to it. Um, that is something, you know, I did miss the deadline for getting the working chassis last year. Um, but I am starting to get a few bits and pieces here or there to start working on it again. And hopefully this year I will get a chassis for it. And then I can start working out how to do the body because the body is, you know, it's one of the things it looks very streamlined. But in actual fact, it's pretty much just, uh, you know, if it wasn't for some of the streamlining, it's pretty much just a, bo a standard boiler on a chassis. And there's not a lot of actual streamlining to it. It's pretty much just the cab. Um, it's not, a you know, a very flat fronted cab. Um, it's a very angled one, and there's also some angling, you know, to do with all the, if you like, the greebling along the, what would be normally be the greebling on top of the boiler. And then obviously you've got that very distinctive uh, Raymond Lowy design prow. So obviously we've got to get uh, that sort of started. Primarily a lot of the stuff I've got on the workbench is just finishing up st uh, some bits and pieces. So, you know, I've built a couple of uh, models of a coach that Glenn Holland did the design for many years ago. And I've built them, I just need to go and get some uh, printed tiles made for the names of the coaches, uh, so I can stick them on, um, and then that's that, that project complete. And the big thing I'm doing at the moment is I'm building some Aja oil electrics, um, which are diesel, en diesel electric engines from the 20s, so the uh, Aja oil electrics um, date from the 1920s. They're, they're built from a consortium of Alco, um, the American Locomotive Company, General Electric for GE, and then IR for Ingersoll Rand. So you get Aja effectively from the initials of the companies. So it was, I think it was that Ingersoll Rand provided the engine, General Electric did all the electrics, and Alco did all the building, pretty much, or something along those lines. Um, there's plenty of information out there if people want to search for it. They were called oil electrics because at the time, at the time they were introduced, which was the 20s, um, America's not long come out of World War One. Um, so, you know, America's not come long out of World War One. Um, there's a bit of an anti-German feeling in America, so calling them diesel electrics, because they're a diesel engine, is possibly not the best thing. Um, so they, so instead of calling them diesel, they just call them oil. 
so they're oil and electric. So they're effectively the fir they're the first mass produced diesel electric locomotive in the world. So they're very so the actual production units are very square. Um, they're effectively a bo they're effectively a box on a pair of bogies. And uh, in the there's four there's obviously a traction motor per I think there was four traction motors one per axle. And then they've got the diesel electric generator in the main body, and they're very, they're very odd looking things. There's a there's, there's radiators above the cab at each end, which actually does the cooling for the uh, engine. You know, they're very odd looking. I want oh, sort of like very odd sort of looking things, but they're again they're the first one of their the first major one um, that people had seen. There's one of the original sort of models which is preserved uh, which is central new jersey number 1000 which was the first actual prototype for these units and um, that's actually i think that's in the baltimore and ohio railroad museum or the bno railroad museum in the thing in baltimore so i'm currently building one, uh, some of those um i've built effectively i've built starting to build two so the whole reason I'm building two is that one is going to be the prototype unit with with no end doors, uh, and then I'm doing uh, one or two of the pro of the production runs, which ha actually have an end end door in the end, so that obviously it means there's an extra entry point in and out of the uh, loco. So I'm starting to work on those and starting to work out the mechanics of them. Um, they're actually uh, I have had Asia. Um, oil electrics models before I actually reverse engineered uh, somebody's seven wide model uh, from Eurobricks uh, initially that went uh, to one of the North Knot shows there's actually footage, footage of it on YouTube of it at one of the very first displays of LNUR uh, it's actually when I joined LNUR many years ago I think it was 20 it was pre I think it was about 2017 2018 um, when I went to that North Knot show um, so there's footage of it from there, and it, you know it's there were some revisions to it then. It wasn't the best model. I then re-engineered it to be an eight-wide model, which is the later version, and then it's sort of come full circle. I'm now building the original, the original sort of style, but I'm actually basing it off um, some natural schematics I've found, which list all the major dimensions, so I can actually work off a scale model based off that. And then really a lot of the other stuff that's on the workbench is, um, in terms of the train models at least, the stuff that's been actively worked on is um, a few bits here or there. So the uh, Brick Model Road have released a beer reefer or refrigerated car uh, for the NMRA National uh, last year. Um, so I've already built one of those, which is the printed uh, printed uh, you know version where, the, where instead of the detail, all the lettering and numbers being decals are actually printed on the actual bricks uh printed on the tiles i should say and so i've built one of those already part way through building um a blank version of that which i've got decals for so i can decal that and pretty much a lot of the other stuff on my workbench is um dabbling in a few bits here or there and in some respects i've kind of although i have got a lot of stuff that's been worked on on and off um a lot of it is stalled at the moment because i I have terrible squirrel syndrome, so I'll start doing one thing. I'll do a bit of it, then get distracted and build something else, then get distracted and build something else, then get distracted and build something else, then drop everything for a bit, then pick up something else entirely, you know, and then I'll just cycle around all these projects, and eventually something will pop out as a completed model. Uh, there's plenty to do. Um, it's just getting the time and the impetus to actually start doing some of this and actually finishing off some of the stuff. And then, of course... Beyond the train models, um, there's all the cityscape-y sorts of stuff I need to do. So I have started building bits of building, uh, whether that's hotel, corner, bars, accommodation, uh, you know, like houses, blocks of flats, that sort of stuff, because um, I need to build those so I've actually got something to run my trains for. So eventually I will have a city display and these buildings will be part of that and I just need to start building some of those um, and actually getting on with, you know, getting stuff done. So as a personal request, could you put the T1 at the top of your list, please? Because I know how, well, I am I think you remember how much I love that locomotive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's actually, and I, and I will point out here, um, the T1, it's, 
it's, it's, it's not going to be a cheap loco when it's finished. Um, uh, so the sound, it's, uh, the reason why it's partly stalled is that I need, I, I really need some of the electronics now. Uh, when I need the, when I say I need electronics, I did mention Dali Electronics previously because that's what Glenn Holland has in his Crusader. Their, their Steam chip, um, I do want one of those along with some of the re switch and that sort of stuff because I'm going to use that in the T1. So on the basis that that's got uh, chuff synchronized sound, so basically um, I can actually have sensors on the wheels, well, on the axles, I should say, um, and they'll actually pick up uh, the rotations of the wheel, and I can then code that into the sound system so that when the wheels rotate, it actually triggers a chuff. So most sound systems actually go off what's either called back EMF uh, from the motor, or they'll base it around, you know, what your speed of the motor is. Because obviously the speed of the motor dictates how fast the wheels turn, that dictates how much chuff you get, and all that sort of stuff. Whereas, that's perfectly all fine for most models, but the T1, because it's two sets of two cylinders, there's that very distinct thing where it does it, its chuff is very unique to that sort of style of loco. So it's either, the, whether it's a T1 or something like the big boy, because the cylinder it's got to effectively two lots of cylinders and the cylinders uh, can drive at different rates, you do need that something which is not that straightforward, just oh, you know, there's this back EMF of I don't know, value six. Um, there's gonna be you know, ten chuffs a minute or you know, one chuff a rotate one chuff a minute or whatever you know, whatever ratio it works out as. So what I'm probably going to do in the meantime is probably hook up something like S brick find a way to because the big thing really is i need to build the boiler once i've got the boiler built and my custom version of the cab uh, sort of fix some of the problems with that because at the moment the cab is i've got a cab that's very much to scale but the problem with the cab is that i need to rework it slightly so that the uh, windows actually dip out uh, slightly to nine wide once i've st- sorted out the motor anchoring and got the other bit sorted i can then probably do some test runs on r104 and um, I know the tender works on R104, but I've yet to work out whether the uh, actual loco <laughs> fixed rigid wheelbase goes around R104. And speaking of the wheelbase, the wheels themselves, um, for the, anyone interested, Joe, who runs Breckland Bricks, um, I actually got him to his custom design the wheels for the T1. And those wheels cost, it, cost me £11 each. So it's got £88 worth in wheels alone. So I am not going to give that project up at any point short of anyone wanting to buy the entire model off me. But no, it, it, it is something that is going to be, I'd probably say it's probably going to be a slow burner project, but once it's finished, and I do, mean, I do say when, it's probably going to be one of the most accurate models I've ever done, not only in terms of scale, but also in terms of the fact that it is it will be as good as a replica as I can do it of a T1, give or take the odd half a stud uh seven inches or so here or there that's going to be a very very cool model to see i have seen some of your stuff online and you definitely know how to put a couple of bricks together so your t1 especially is something i'm very keen for i have also had a particular commission from joe before so i can understand how expensive those wheels could be i think it might be worth well potentially um, giving him another visit to see if you can get those rods custom made as well because the connection point for the uh, crank axle I forget the correct terminology here but they're a bit more larger a bit more rounder for where they're connected to the wheels I was about to say yeah the uh, the rods on the T1 are very thick the uh, crank pins especially are a lot thicker than uh, what you'd normally find um, especially on British stuff because I think a lot of people compare you know American models to, Brit- uh, American models to British ones and British stuff. Don't get me wrong. British locos are, can be incredibly powerful, but a lot of the time the crank pins and the connection rods look very feeble in comparison to American models, and that's because American American locomotives are so much more powerful. You know, this is our thing. You know, American models. American models are, as I said, thirty three percent bigger um, comparatively in terms of loading gauge. Whether that's thirty three percent in the height, the width, or the length. Um, just because American American railroads are so are a so much 
were so much better built and b didn't have a lot of originally didn't have a lot of tunnels they just went over a lot of stuff so they could or if they did build tunnels they actually built their tunnels big enough which is something the british really should have started doing earlier on so yeah, uh, cut, sp- bespoke rods from joe uh, are on the cars in the future but because the connection points i will be using are no different i'm currently going to use the standard uh what you'd call the stock rods whether you get those from there's somebody in america called train bricks um who does the rods as well so i'm now getting mine from joe because obviously joe is in this country you know there's no import there's not much of a delay um and joe you know i can send him a message on facebook and go you know i need you know i need well, the current thing is, like with the age of diesels, I need a blank disc wheel. Um, because if you go, if you want some standard Lego wheels, and this is the one that come with the train motor, there's about, I think when I looked on Bricklink, there was nine available. Um, and to get them from Lego costs £1.80 each, so I might as well go to Pajot and get them for £2.50, £2.75 for a bespoke, more accurate, sort of plain disc wheel. The rods will need to be bought, which are a specialist thing. Um, the sound system is going to be specialist uh, whenever I get that. So um, hopefully the rest of the model will be fairly stand- standard Lego. So uh, <laughs> I think the big thing really is I need I need to get it uh, to a bigger track because at the moment it's on one of the shelves and just the tender and the fixed wheelbase alone um, is pretty much on the end of the shelf. Uh, so I need to give it get it somewhere where it's got a bit more room to grow. And that will mark the end of the episode. Thank you so much, Matt, for coming on. No, that's quite all right, Luke, any time. This was a very different podcast episode to all the ones I've done so far. You were very dominant in the conversation, and you, and you basically taught me a lot about what you're up to and a bit more about railroads in general. Yeah, it's uh, it's 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 certainly different, you know. I mean, realistically, uh, you know... It's a bit funny. We always we there's all the joking Alan you are that uh, that you've got an American building British stuff and a British person building an American stuff. We really should have swapped them. <laughs> I'm not I'm not sure Trace would would quite agree to that, but uh... <laughs> yeah, I think you'll be all right with it though. So Matt is online. Do you want to give yourself a quick shout out for social media? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I'm available on uh, Facebook and YouTube. So you just search for Matt's Brick Railroad Works. You'll find me on there. I haven't got any shows planned or shows attending planned this year. 2024, I know it sounds so far off because we're only just in February 2023, but 2024, theoretically planning a trip to the Amherst uh, Model Railway Society exhibition, which is normally the last weekend in January, um, which is in America, and then July again. Next year should be Tom Stock 2024, from the Modeler's Life podcast. We'll try my darndest to try and go to the uh, Tom Stock at least, because because the one in this year, uh, last year I should say, was a bundle of fun. Um, I'll try and get to Springfield and join with the uh, LGMSP crew over there. If I can finish uh, Great Western, uh, some Great Western coaches, I might take the uh, Block Junction Hall I've got sitting on one of my shelves, along with a couple of coaches, and then there'll be some British stuff on, on uh, running as well. But yeah, there'll, there'll probably be something coming up this year, um, whether it's sooner or later. So keep an eye out on Facebook and YouTube, and uh, hopefully I'll get some. I'll put some time aside to start editing all the stuff from uh, last year's Bristol Brick Show and getting that up there as well. That all sounds very exciting. I cannot wait to see all of that take place. So all of these social media links from Matt's Brick Railroad Works will be in the description down below. And we will BRB with more BRBs. Thank you all ever so much for listening, and I shall see you all in the next episode. Bye, everyone. Thank you, bye.